you would not only cut down all of the uh, emission from, you know, one of the, the big uh, um, guzzler of oil is actually simply the production of soil fertilizers, of chemical fertilizer. So you wouldn't need this chemical fertilizer in the first place. So you would not only save a lot of uh, uh, um, um, carbon being emitted into the atmosphere, but you would also start sequestering carbon. And it says enough carbon to satisfy 73% of the Kyoto target for c CO2 reduction in the U.S. Now, obviously, the, the Kyoto uh, targets are not perfect, but we're not even coming close to knowing how to meet them. Three-fourths of those targets could be met simply by transforming our corn production to organic. And this is not talking about moving our farming to sustainable agriculture to a system that looks more like Joel. So to me, this is like an incredible, you know, uh, um, an incredible message, like what the potential in really um, not only addressing global warming, but potentially solving it, which, you know, I feel like there's very little hope <laughs> uh, when you think about global warming. Um, can we go to the next slide? Let's see. Um, uh, so 160 was, was the conventional uh, corn and soy, but we have 431 million acres uh, of croplands in the U.S. Um, if we could convert that to organic, again, not a radical transformation, just moving into organic, um, it would uh, uh, translate to over half of all American cars being taken off the road, and that's uh, almost two trillion of car, car miles not driven. Um, you know, again, it's, 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 it's pretty in, in, incredible. Um, so, but Joe is not thinking, how can I solve global warming? He's not thinking, um, again, how can I uh, produce more or healthier meat? He's not thinking about how can I retain more water for times of droughts. He's just thinking, um, how do I respect the cowness of the cow? And he trusts that when you do that, you know, all falls into place. And I think this is really the most radical lesson that can be learned on Joel Farm. Um, so it's not just that we're moving from a linear system, right? Like, let's go back to this idea that we, we live in this linear system where we just extract and we dump. Clearly, Joe Salatin Farm is this incredible web of life, you know, more of a circle where everything has its place, everything plays a role. So it's not only that we're moving from this mindset to this other really radical mindset where we understand ourselves very differently. It's also that um, since we're part of the system, right, since we're no longer separate, what would it mean to express our uh, uniqueness? Um, the Anna-ness of Anna, the Susan-ness of Susan. Um, who else? Ori-ness of Ori. <laughs> um, how do we, what happens when we express our uh, essential uniqueness? What, what would fall into place? And I'm not asking this um, question just, just superficially. Like really, like what do you believe would fall into place? I think that the, you know, what, what really uh, the, what Raj talk, uh, brought up a lot of really interesting things yesterday. And I was wondering how it, it meshed with, with what, you know, how I'm perceiving things at this point in my life. Um, and, you know, he talked about, um, we talk, somebody brought up like this very uh, uh, important question, like we're so overstretched, you know, and he said, oh, maybe we need to slow down. Well, you know, if we really take seriously, and not just seriously for our own well-being, but um, if we really take seriously expressing who we are, in some ways, like if we take seriously just becoming who we are, being happy, taking our place, whatever you want to frame it, but with the trust, with the belief that when we do that, we actually can heal not only ourselves, but our community and the world, um, it's a very, very, very radical uh, different way, I think, to, to look at things. Um, and it's very freeing because... I think that um, a big part of, of, our, of what needs to happen, as Raj pointed out yesterday, is that we need to start finding that place to reconnect with community, to find time to do things, um, to change the world outside of us. So it's not to say, like, oh, this is all you got to do. No. But how do you find the emotional space, the mental space, the, the physical space to start doing these things? Um, so I mentioned earlier, uh, maybe let's try to see what's, what's now, I don't, chickenness of the chicken. Okay, we can stay on, on Will. Um, so I mentioned earlier that our journey starts right here, um, where we are in our personal life and, and in the world. But obviously that's not easy, um, because that means truly seeing the situation for what it is. 
um, I, th I believe that we all are, all of us, are more or less in denial <laughs> of our situation and of the world uh, uh, circumstances. Um, it makes sense to be in denial. Um, there is a lot of suffering, and um, you know why? Why face suffering if there is a way to distract ourselves from suffering? Um, but by denying diffic difficulty, uh, we never learn that difficulty can be uh, creative and fruitful. Um, so we must have the courage to be true to our situation. And it's only by doing so that we can respond not out of habit, not out of fear um, or self-preservation, but instead we can address the situation in self, bringing forth a fresh answer. And I think this is really important because we tend, again, that same mindset. You know, if you think about your own life, the life of your friends, your community, or, or what's going on in the world, we really are answering out of habit and out of fear. And this is where we're not going to be able to bring about meaningful change if that's what we do. Somehow we need to allow situation to bring out answers. What is amazing about Joel Salatin's farm is that that's exactly what happened. When Joel's father started the farm, he brought some expert over. The farm was really run down. And everybody told him the, the same thing, private and uh, government consultant. They told him, you know, um, put, the, uh, um, put some seed lot, feed lot, um, um, plant some corn, uh, graze the forest, you know, the same mindset. And his father knew enough, like had enough common sense to be like, that doesn't make sense. I need to heal this land. And he started doing things differently. But he really allowed somehow, you know, his trust in, or his belief system to bring out uh, uh, new solutions. And obviously what Joel is doing is not, it's not all his ideas. He's, he's been taking uh, ideas from a lot of different people, but he's allowed in some ways the situation to bring out answer. But I think that the best example of this is really um, Will Allen. Um, when Will came to Milwaukee, um, probably seven, well, almost 20 years ago, um, he had been a basketball player, he had a successful career in corporate America, and he came and he saw this uh, uh, last urban farm in Milwaukee, and what he could have seen in the neighborhood was basically scarcity, uh, poverty, um, obesity, health problems, uh, de you know, depression, uh, and employment. And instead of seeing this, he saw potential. And so he bought this farm uh, in the middle of, of uh, inner city Milwaukee. And now he's turning a million pound of uh, food waste from local businesses, from uh, uh, food industries, and he's turning it into an incredibly fertile soil. And he's able to grow an incredible amount of food for the community. Um, Will is, again, someone that I feel like took his place. You know, he's really doing what he's meant to do. And um, if you don't believe me, um, he got the, the MacArthur Genius Award, so somebody else recognized that. And also, um, he, he was nominated one of the most influential 100 men uh, in Time Magazine. So there's starting to be, I think, you know, again, like this idea that when you, when you do really do what, what you felt was right, somehow recognition can come around. And it took a long time. It's not like it, it happens overnight. But um, he's been recognized now for his work. Um, Will always emphasizes relationship. Um, on, his, on his farm, relationship has are everything. Um, that's how he can collect so much waste to turn into soil. That's how he changes eating habits. Uh, think about a bunch of young people working on his farm, uh, not only getting their hand dirty and earning a salary, um, but also then bringing back this fresh food to their families and communities um, and therefore uh, changing, changing habits. And it's also um, a relationship in the sense of hundreds and hundreds of people coming to his farm every year to train. And these are not going to be necessarily farmers. Um, but what they learn is probably what I've learned uh, on Wolf's Farm is hope, inspiration, and the idea of community. Um, I, I, I do not kid you when... when Will repeats every few sentences, relationship, relationship, relationship. You know, where do you start when you want to uh, start a farm? What do you do? And he keeps talking about relationship. Who are the people in your community that are doing this, that you need to connect, et cetera, et cetera. So um, those are, there's a few slides about Will. <laughs> I'm sorry, the, the presentation part is not really working. There was a little clip. Um, this is uh, his composting piles uh, in his farm. Um, this is uh, um, the way he transformed the, the waste into incredible fertile soil through Vermont composting. Um, the, you know, you remember from the movie, the worms are his babies. Um, go ahead. Um, some example of how he produces vertically so much food in his farm. Um, so do you all know Julia Butterfly Hill? Whew, that, that's inspiration right there. So um, for those who don't know Julia, 
Uh, she's best known, best known for living in a 180-foot-tall, roughly 1,500-years-old California redwood tree for two years, two years without touching the ground, uh, to prevent loggers um, from the Pacific Lumber Company from cutting it down. Um, when I, very, very early on, when I started thinking about uh, Fresh, I went to a Bioneer conference, which is, uh, I don't know if you've been to the Bioneer conference, but it is quite, quite an amazing uh, conference. And Julia was talking, and um, she was standing there, and she's an incredible uh, speaker, and I was talking about our experience doing this, and the whole time I just felt so little. I was like, I couldn't do this. You know, I couldn't, I'm not that dedicated. I mean, it's crazy spending two years of your life up in a tree, and I felt like, I was really just in, in this doubt and questioning, like, what, what should I do? Am I doing enough? Like, all of these kind of questions. And as if reading my mind, Julia said that um, we shouldn't look at the speakers and think, oh, I couldn't be up there speaking, I'm not, and then, you know, fill up the blank, what you're thinking. Um, and she reminded us that each one of us uh, need to find our place, our role in the world, and that this was the most meaningful contribution we could offer. Um, I borrowed the, the title, uh, the first part of the title for today's talk from a great book by Norman Fisher um, called uh, entitled Taking Our Places. And um, Norman is a, a Zen Buddhist uh, um, priest and a teacher. He's a really amazing person. And this book is, is, is quite incredible. Um, in, the intro in, in, in the introduction, he writes, each of us has a place in this world. Taking that place, I've come to feel, is our real job as human being. We are not generic people. We are individual, and when we appreciate that fact completely and allow ourselves to embrace it and grow into it fully, we see that taking our unique place in this world is the one thing that gives us of our um, ultimate fulfillment. Um, he continues by telling the story of Bhutu Trisman, who sneak, oops, can you stop that, I'm sorry. Uh, can I? Yeah. Uh, so he, he continued by, ta by telling the story of Bhutu Trisman, who sneak into the room of their children as they sleep and whisper in their ear, uh, become what you are. So we don't need to become someone else, um, to do more, to do differently, to change profession. I'm asked that all the time. Um, you know, what should I do? Should I become a farmer? Um, should I quit my job? You know, what, what should I do? Um, we don't need to move to a different place where um, things might, might be um, easier to live more in accordance uh, with nature. Um, what we need to do is live more fully, our own life. Um, imagine what would happen if each one of us approached our life, lives every day with an open mind and a desire to give, to help, to heal. And, you know, I'm, I just, I'm assuming that our workplace, our communities uh, would be really deeply transformed. Um, I'm finishing with a slide from, uh, of my daughter, Mayan, and I'm doing this because of a good friend of mine told me that um, people really liked better talks when there was pictures of babies and puppies. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was actually a, 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 a little clip of, of uh, Joel Salat and um, of Will Allen saying, you know, can you do this? Can you do this? You know, like the pep talk. And I felt like we, you know, this was a good place for the, the pep talk. Can you do this? And instead of can you do this in terms of, you know, can you plant? Can you build a, a compost uh, bin? Can you, can you live more fully? You know, can you truly respect your unique voice? Can you really come to face your struggles, your doubts, your sadness? you know, with courage and allow solution to arise? Can you really face the struggles and, and, and crisis in your community, in the world, not only with courage, but with the deep trust that it's also a time of change and opportunity? You know, can you do it? And you know, I don't know if I can't do it, but certainly um, I wanna try. And um, what better reason to try than 